Hi guys, welcome to your very first installment of Wacky Bio Bentley videos. It's our goal this year is to uh, show you small increments, remember less than 15 minutes each video, uh, small increments in topics in biology to help you learn and understand biology. And in essence, these videos are designed for you to watch jot down important information, list at least three questions you have, and then during the class time we'll be engaging in rich and meaningful activities to uh, better your understanding. So this is day one, let's start. And we want to look at what is biology. Now hopefully uh, you've already had some experience with dissecting terms and words. <laughs> Who's that dork? Uh, so Anytime you encounter a word in biology or a phrase that you don't know, a nerdy science term, chances are if you break it in half or split it into chunks, you can then at least gain a better understanding of what the term means. So if you look at the prefix bio, bio actually means first to life or living organisms. So our uh, main focus of study this year is solely life. Now we won't be focusing just on plants and animals. I want to study dolphins. Mm, we'll obviously get into a lot of specifics about living organisms, but first we really have to understand what life is and how life itself and all organisms work. And that can be uh, sometimes a daunting task, but it's oh so interesting. Now the second half of the word, the ology or logy, uh, L-O-G-Y, refers to, naturally you've heard terms geology, physiology, that simply means the study of. So again, all we're going to be doing is studying life. Now, I mean, kind of a gruesome picture here, but you can see <laughs> this, this chick's alive, this thing's not anymore. Kind of disgusting, but uh, uh, conflicting life and death there. And, and I chose this picture not because of the life and death, but really more so because they're, um, it's actually exhibiting, if you know where to look and you know what the characteristics of life are, what makes something alive, this scene actually exhibits, this picture shows a lot of the characteristics, uh, some of them explicit, some of them kind of hidden. So what we really want to do is, first, if we're going to be studying life, what actually makes something alive? Uh, if you were to be presented with a rock, is a rock alive? Now you might laugh at that statement, but um, scientists actually have developed some criteria to determine whether something is living or not. And it seems pretty uh, cut and dry, black and white, but sometimes there's a gray area we'll see later in the years. But let's start and take a look at these characteristics. So what we're going to look at really quickly in this video and then uh, practice later in class is in order to be alive, there in essence are some rules, if you will. Uh, we can think of this as a list of if you want to be alive, you better have or show or do exhibit the following. So what we're going to look at, all living things have to reproduce. All living things have to have what is called the genetic code. We're going to be studying a term you probably have heard of before, DNA. Uh, they must be made up of one or more cells. All living things have to grow and develop, and we've got to be careful with this one uh, because there are, we'll see with this uh, last one, some individually single-celled organisms that don't really grow noticeably larger, but grow and develop and change in, in subtle ways. Uh, speaking of change, uh, we've got to be careful with this one also. By change, we don't mean grow larger or grow hair. We mean change as a species or evolve. We're going to be studying evolution, which is a fascinating topic later on in the year. Uh, they have to respond to their environment. Believe it or not, uh, as you know, you, can, you respond to your environment all the time. We'll look at an example here in a moment. Um, even single-celled organisms, like an amoeba, uh, a bacterium, can respond to their environment. They have to obtain and use energy. Uh, you may have heard the term metabolism, we'll look at in a second. Uh, you have to have intake some type of raw materials and undergo reactions so that you have energy to run your machine. And the last one we'll end up looking at this year is that they have to regulate their internal environment. The nerdy term for that we'll see is homeostasis. We're actually going to uh, dabble in that this year. A nerdy word, but really essentially this term means same, same. Uh, you want to keep your internal conditions. You don't want drastic changes. 
which we'll look at in a second. So our goal here is let's quickly look at some examples and briefly talk about each one of these because this is kind of like our syllabus. This is what we're going to be studying this year. So with the first one, <clears throat> stop blushing. I'm pretty sure you know what reproduce is. Uh, obviously in this example here, the horse is not in the, uh, <clears throat> forgive me, the act of reproducing. It is already reproduced. And stop and look at the image for a second. What do you notice about the horse? And it's little baby horse here, for lack of a better term. Uh, the baby, the offspring, resembles the parent. Same body structure, same size, uh, or will be the same size, rather similar shape. So when organisms reproduce, they're not making some brand new freak offspring. They're generating offspring or babies that look very much like themselves. And that works for animals like the horse. It works for plants as well. You probably know what these things are. Acorns, this isn't, we can see the leaves here, this is an oak tree. Uh, those acorns are, in essence, are the babies. Uh, they'll fall to the ground, as you may know, and germinate, and then uh, produce a seedling, which will in turn grow into an oak tree that has similar bark, or the same type of bark, same shape and size leaves. So all living things have to be able to reproduce. The next one is, is we're going to get into later on in the year, but you have to have a genetic code. And now by code, really, think of what a code does. You're usually sending messages or instructions somewhere, uh, telling someone to do something, or sending them a message filled with information. And that's exactly what, in humans, this code is. Uh, working backwards, this human has traits. You're a human, you have eyes, you have hair, and just like with our horses, many of your traits resemble your parents. Uh, we're going to see we're made up of cells, and inside those cells are what you probably have heard of chromosomes and genes. And in essence, if we really zoom in on a very, very tiny level later on this year, we'll see that our genetic code is based on this weird lateral, uh, excuse me, ladder twisted thing here, DNA. That's going to be of interest to us much later on, very important. Uh, another key requirement going down our list, if you're alive, you have to have at least one, usually more, cells. Now, in eighth grade, you may have uh, remembered studying cells and learning about the parts of cells, and we'll do that here this year, but uh, the interesting thing here that we can see about cells is that there really are not uh, rules in here. Uh, this is actually an organism, a single-celled organism called an amoeba. And you can see it's this blobby shape. It's not a well-defined circular or square cell. And in fact, in here, this darkened spot is its nucleus. That's actually where its DNA, its code, is held. So this guy can reproduce uh, and make more amoeba. Well, so uh, cells, we're going to see, can be very, 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 very diverse in uh, their sizes and in their shapes. Uh, this mess here is actually um, what something that we're going to be looking at later on this year, and it's uh, they are individual cells. Each box, uh, if you will, is a cell. We can see our nuclei, our single singular nucleus in each cell. Each one of these cells looks a little different because they're in the process of reproducing, but this is actually from um, what we'll be looking at later on in the year, an onion root. Um, so notice that not all cells have to be the same size, or at all do they have to ever be the same shape. Uh, we're going to see a lot of diversity here in uh, life. Moving on our list, a uh, pretty simple one, um, but we've got to be careful, as we said, grow and develop. All living things, looking at uh, something that occurs throughout the year, we're all familiar with amphibians and, in essence, frogs, uh, they go when they hatch from eggs. If we look at the life cycle and follow this, look at how this thing, uh, we try not to use the term thing in biology ever in science, this uh, organism grows and develops and changes over time. Not only does it get larger, but notice it uh, loses its tail. We'll talk about how and why that occurs. It grows limbs. Uh, the tadpole actually breathes with gills. This guy breathes with lungs. So vast changes uh, throughout many, many organisms' life cycles. Next to last one here, and this one's kind of a tough one to show, but the idea of evolving, changing over time. And now we're not talking a minute, an hour, a day, a week, 
usually a month or year. We're talking long periods of time in which a species such as humans or a particular species of bird evolve and acquire and develop these characteristics that allow them to fit in. Um, and without being too complicated, I'm going to leave you with a what some people might think a controversial picture, uh, which many people have a wrong impression of what evolution is. Um, these are individual species, and they did not evolve from one another. Um, but notice that they have some similar traits here, and we're going to look at evolution, uh, how man, how human and woman have evolved and changed over tens of thousands of years. Really, really interesting. And our very last, or excuse me, the next to last one I want to look at, uh, respond to the environment. This is almost too diverse to even uh, address or, or, or look at. Countless examples of, uh, well, you can see here, this critter's obviously responding to the environment, trying to bite your face off. Um, but a response to the environment could be a conscious action, trying to attack you and bite you. It could even be a subtle, uh, subconscious um reaction, uh, your heart rate increasing, you beginning to shiver, uh, an unconscious behavior, something that's going on inside of your body. All of these things are responses and all living things, even single-celled critters, do it. Uh, wide variety. Uh, just a quick another example in terms of plants. Notice what's going on here. This plant, and you may have noticed this occurring in your home, the plant Plants don't really move around. Plants can't get up, and, and this plant uh, appears to be leaning and growing in this direction. The light is coming, unidirectional light, from this. This is a, an example of what is called phototropism. Uh, the bean seedlings are actually uh, slowly growing towards the light. That is absolutely phototropism, absolutely a response to the environment, and it's a great example. Uh, obtain and utilize energy is, think about that, a pretty simple one. Oh, I have to eat. Well, that is, that is true, but it goes beyond that. When you eat, what happens to those molecules? We'll be talking about that here in the first unit and later on. <laughs> one of my favorite pictures. Think about this great white eating the seal. Oh, don't cry, uh, because prior to this picture, this seal was doing the same thing to fish. So. All living things have to eat. But this shark will eat the seal. But then what happens to the seal's muscles and fat once it's inside of the shark? The shark will obviously digest that. But then those molecules will be turned into energy and other structures. So this is an important one that we'll visit many times throughout the year. Uh, another quick example, uh, this guy right here, uh, if you're from Westerly, uh, Many people call it panel. Uh, this is actually a sulfur shelf, a chicken mushroom uh, that grows off of, usually off of trees. And this thing doesn't produce its own food. It's actually uh, breaking down uh, carbohydrates and structures inside of the tree and gaining its energy and nutrition from the tree. Kind of a weird thing. But again, it's a different example of obtaining and using energy. Doesn't matter how you do this rule or follow this rule as long as you do it. Uh, another example, a uh, uh, very familiar one, obviously trees absorbing sunlight, plants absorbing that, undergoing photosynthesis to generate food and in turn make energy. We'll be looking at that this year. And our last one is kind of a weird one, uh, regulating the internal environment. All living things have to do it. Here's an example. Stop and think about what is this showing? How is this snake regulating its internal environment? What is it doing? What is it trying to regulate? by doing so. If you think about it, you can probably figure that out. Uh, <laughs> what's this little chubby cartoon guy doing? Look at the sweat coming off of him. Why do you sweat? What's going on? Do you choose to sweat or does your body do it of its own accord? Right here, regulating the internal environment. Absolutely. Uh, and, and the last one, leave you with this, uh, I chose to go the cartoon route here. I don't know why he has a, a ball in this image, but what's this little guy doing? <laughs> he's doing what he's supposed to be doing, but uh, getting rid of waste, urinating and defecating is actually is a key requirement to this homeostasis. All right. And we won't be studying urination specifically, but it's an example of getting rid of waste. You do that to keep your internal environment constant. So hopefully this was a quick overview. Hope you took uh, decent notes, and this is a uh, syllabus, if you will, of everything we're going to be studying this year. So. Good luck, have fun, but not too much fun.